Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Great. Uh, for those of you that may not know me, I'm Esther Newman, the CEO and founder of Leadership Montgomery, although my real job title is Chief Troublemaker. Um, so welcome. Uh, you've already heard the request that your phones be silenced. Uh, we will say it's okay to tweet if you'd love to, if you'd like to do that. Uh, we want to start off by wishing you happy Veterans Day. Uh, freedom is not free. If Thank a vet. And for those of you uh, that are Leadership Montgomery graduates and participants, you received an email today. And if you click on the picture, there's a very nice tribute that's very lovely that was done for vets. And uh, if we have any veterans in the audience, it's a little difficult for me to see out there. We'll ask them to stand and we'll applaud all of our vets, whether they're here or not. Oh. Excellent. Thank you all for your service. In honor of our speaker this evening, we asked his what his pet charity is, and he said anything relating to kids and education. So we are delighted to have present a gift to a donation in honor of Dr. Hrabowski to College Tracks, and I've just learned that he's already met with the College Tracks students and developed a relationship there, so that makes it even better. So. Uh, Nancy, the check is in the mail, and we know you'll put it to good use. Thank you so much to our Montgomery College support for this evening for hosting and sponsoring, and to Leadership Montgomery graduates Dr. Darian Pollard and Dr. Brad Stewart for their support, and also to David Sears, who's here this evening as well, uh, Senior Vice President for Advancement and Community Education for sponsoring and hosting this evening. And please give a warm Leadership Montgomery welcome to Brad Stewart, the VP and Provost for this campus. Thank you, Esther. I'm a proud graduate of the class of 2014. Uh, I got a shout out. Uh, our nickname is the class that went there. And you'll have to figure that out on your own. And use your detective powers. Welcome to what we call here in downtown Silver Spring, uh, our living room. The college's mission is to help empower our students to change their lives. And it is to help our community become a better place. Uh, and so we love to invite folks into our living room uh, on various evenings for wonderful events like this. So please make yourselves comfortable uh, and sit back and enjoy something really wonderful brought to you by this great partnership between Leadership Montgomery uh, and Montgomery College. So Dave and I, uh, Dave Sears and I are very proud to both sponsor and host this event. Uh, so you're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, we have with us Dr. Freeman Hubrowski, the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And I just wanted to add something a little bit to the introduction he's going to get from Esther, and that is uh, more years than I care to talk about ago, I was in an administrator's boot camp training program sponsored by the American College on Educa Council on Education. Uh, and one of our first instructors to come and talk to us about diversity, uh, in closing the achievement gap uh, was Freeman Hrabowski. Uh, and we all decided after one morning with Dr. Hrabowski that we all wanted to be like him when we grew up. <laughs> so I'm really pleased to be here tonight and I'm gonna sit down front here uh, and still wanna be just like Freeman when I grow up. Esther? Thank you, Brad. I should also add that I'm a proud Montgomery College alum. I first met Dr. Freeman Rabowski in 1992 when he applied for the Leadership Maryland class for that brand new program and I was on the founding board. He had just begun as the president of UMBC, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He took a no-name commuter school, and that's a quote from Wikipedia, into one of the top 10 innovative schools in the universities in the United States. He's been recognized in US News and World Report and all kinds of publications. You may have seen him on the cover of Time Magazine or listed as one of the 100 most influential people in the United States. Freeman has been named by President Obama to chair a commission on advancing minority students. 
He was, a, he was named as a potential candidate for the U.S. Secretary of Education. And personally, I'm glad they got Arne Duncan and we still have Freeman Hrabowski. <laughs> he has more than 20 honorary degrees. And if I wanted to tell you about all the national TV shows he's been on, including 60 Minutes, it's a list as long as my arm, so I'm not going to. Um, he's been invited to speak all over the world. He is just an amazing man, and we are just so, I'm so thankful that we still have him here in Maryland. Uh, we are delighted to have Steve Simon this evening as our moderator. Steve has worked, another Leadership Montgomery graduate who's worked in the public and private sector and has a great passion for education, so he's just perfect for this. We are delighted to have him as the moderator. Uh, you've received some index cards as you came in, so if you have questions, you can make a note, and Allie will come down the, si down the aisles to pick them up later in the program. So please give a warm Leadership Montgomery welcome to Dr. Freeman Hrabowski and Steve Simon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Esther. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And you're going to take that chair. Okay. Good. Hello, everybody. Good to be here. A couple of years ago, I was asked to do one of these same types of style events, and somebody said, will you sit on stage and do an interview, and we've got an audience, and it was an interview with somebody that a lot of people in the audience may be very familiar with, named Carolyn Hacks, a columnist for the Washington Post, but I didn't read a lot of advice columns, obviously, looking at my life, so I didn't know who she was, so I did a lot of homework for that one, but when I was asked by um, Esther and Ali to interview this man, I said, I'll do a little homework, but I don't have to because I've been doing homework on this man for a long, long time. And uh, as Esther said, you just heard a little bit of the accolades and the, the organizations that have honored Dr. Freeman Rabowski for his leadership, among other things, as well as all the success of his university. Uh, but if we were to list them all, I think we would be here all night, and we don't want to do that. We want to hear from the good doctor himself. So instead of recounting those, I'm going to start with the very simple question yeah. first. Okay. What makes Freeman Hrabowski a successful leader? Wow, what makes me a, that, that assumes that I am successful. <laughs> I think I've been very fortunate, Steve. I, I would say any successful leader is someone who has wonderful people with whom to work. If I am successful at all, and I prefer to think about the success of my colleagues and my, my campus, my students especially, it would be the people. I think no one can be successful in any position without people, the people with whom you associate, the people with whom you work. And what makes us successful is this strength of the community of UMGC, of my colleagues and students. That's, that's what success is about. It is not about the person, no. You're starting to get a little bit of a, a view into the humility, too, of, of a great, great leader, I think. Uh, let me go See, back. Can I say something that people were laughing Absolutely. Laugh at? When I was young, I was probably cocky. <laughs> <laughs> and some of you may appreciate this, but the older you get, the more you realize how important humility is. You really, <laughs> my grandmother was right. She really was. <laughs> So it's not false humility, I promise you, it is not. It, it is genuine. <laughs> Let me go back a few years. Sure, sure. So this is 1992, everybody. 22 years ago, Bill Clinton defeated George Bush and Ross Perot to become the 42nd <laughs> president of the United States. Gas was $1.05 a gallon. You guys think it's good now. Gas was $1.05 a gallon. And the Washington Redskins were the victors in Super Bowl XXVI. <laughs> And over at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in Catonsville, Dr. Freeman Rabowski, a young administrator who had come up through the ranks, was named the new president of UMBC. Yeah. Now I know, and we all in this room know, that with all you've accomplished in building the success and the reputation of UMBC over the years, even had a big basketball win a few years ago, I remember, <laughs> there have been many opportunities to move on. Other university presidencies, politics, I'm aware of those, business, government, and, and yet you've resisted all such opportunities and UMBC has continued to rise. 
What is it above all else that has kept you so passionate for 22 plus years and going about leading UMBC forward? I think I am fascinated by the, by the prospect of a, a campus for middle class people, working class, middle class people, could become, become known as a place that represents the best of brain power. You see, when we think about public universities, we tend to think about sports so often. I went to the University of Illinois, went to Ham my beloved Hampton, and then Illinois. And, and, and Illinois has wonderful Nobel laureates, and yet people, when people talk about big institutions, they often talk about the basketball, the football, and all of that's wonderful. But there's great brain power in all those places that people don't talk about. But when we talk about the, the best of private institutions, we think brain power. Think about it. Carnegie Mellon. You don't think sports. You think brain power. Well, our goal, my colleagues and I, our goal was to be so good academically that we could say to the country and beyond that we represent a special idea. And the idea was this. You don't have to be rich to be brilliant, to be serious, to want to be the very best academically, intellectually. And so we've taken great pride in saying to kids, we don't want you to be embarrassed about being smart. We want you to be thrilled about being really smart. With really smart meaning you can think well and you work your butt off to be the best. Now that's kept me there, because I've always been a nerd. My son, my grandson will tell you, my wife and I have always been mega nerds, he would say, quite frankly. <laughs> to which we respond, but mega nerds can pay all their bills when they're grown, somehow. <laughs> if you have any idea. <laughs> the, uh, so that, that has kept me there. It is a nerdy place. And it's a place that's not, that does not speak privilege so much. It, and that's, I'm not saying anything about being wealthy. It's great to be wealthy, but I'm simply saying it is wonderful for a public institution to be known as a place where really smart kids can come and come from middle class, working class families, whatever, and be really the best. Well, you say a nerdy place, but you have some element of competition. You guys yes. are very, very competitive over there. Yes. And one of the things that some people may know <laughs> is that you did have a national championship team at UMBC. Yes, yes, yes. Tell us about the chess team yeah, at UMBC. Chess team. We are very good in chess. In fact, all of the 18 level people are grandmasters. Are grandmasters. The, the Maryland chess champion is usually on the C level team to give you a sense of the quality. You know, to become a grandmaster, you have to go to Europe and be the grandmaster. So these are really, and now what you would know is that that all of the grandmasters come from other countries or have a beginning in another country with a parent. Uh, and, uh, and all of our women players are from other countries. We in America don't really encourage girls to play chess. Just as we have had a 50% drop in the percentage of women in computer science. And these are cultural issues because half of my grad students in computer science are women. They just are not from America. They tend to be from India or China or Turkey, you know. And so, and what am I saying? I'm saying that, you no, know, we are competitive. We are competitive, but we are competitive intellectually. And we win sometimes. We do fairly well in soccer. We're getting ready for a championship in soccer and, and, and uh, lacrosse. And uh, the basketball team reads well. <laughs> and they win some also. And they graduate and they get jobs, yes. It's a, we are very proud of that, all right? So student athlete is the notion, student athlete. We're gonna get back to UMBC a little bit, but yeah. I wanna talk a little bit about yeah. some of the events that, that have shaped sure. your life. Sure. So what are the things or events in your life that have been most responsible for shaping you? And huh? you may wanna go back to childhood because huh? some folks may like to hear that. We're, we're all products of our childhood experiences and I was very fortunate to have educated parents in Birmingham to grow up in an in educated environment. Birmingham was a fascinating place. It was the best, of, the best of worlds and the worst of worlds in many ways. If you can imagine Birmingham in the 50s and 60s, but this middle class community really did work to protect us from the meanness at that time of so many things. And yet, and, and it was a place. So in my community, in the middle class Birmingham community, you had everybody from uh, Alma Vivian Powell, whose father was a principal and whose uncle was my principal, to Angela Davis, 
the big Afro years later, right, whose mother taught me, and uh, my mother taught me, and my brothers and sisters, and, and uh, to, to Connie Rice, whose uncle was my, whose father was my high school counselor. So you had the range of thinking in many ways. We were all different, are, and we all had the same background. Strong parents, educated, determined to give their children the best, with an emphasis on reading and thinking, and doing what we could, doing what they could to, to supplement what we were not getting in the school. And that was the, and that was it. And my parents were older, and, and most of our parents, quite frankly, were older because they wanted to wait until they could give their children the best. So my parents really were much older when I was born. And if you know anything about children of older parents, <laughs> they grow up being old somehow. I mean, you, it's a good thing. I mean, you, you're, they treat you, you're not treated like a little kid who can't think you all your life. Well, speaking of being old, talk about yes. being 12 years old. Oh. And a decision that, oh. that you made that uh, other kids may not, not have made at 12. And, you know, and I have a book coming out with Decompressed that talks about my childhood in the civil rights movement. And you know, every, every book that comes out always talks about how underprivileged kids were. Well, I was not underprivileged. I was blessed. I was really blessed. I had strong, religious, hardworking parents who did everything they could. What I, what I got as a child is what I would want every child to get, where parents believe in their children. You know, where they believe in the power of education uh, and they teach them to think critically. We want every child, and when a child doesn't get that at home, we want to have communities that help children to develop that. That's what's so important. But, but I, we were in church much too much, by my estimation. We were always <laughs> in church, it seems. We meant, must I go? Yes, you must go. And, and we, it was in the middle of the week, and I'll never forget, they always tried to placate me in one way or another. My mother was, my dad just said, boy, get up, we're going to church, wait a minute. But uh, uh, so the two things I love most, eating and, and math. And so they allowed me to sit in the back of the church, do my math and eat. I was eating M&Ms, the, the good kind with peanuts, <laughs> and doing my math. And uh, I hear this man at the lectern there on stage saying, uh, and if the children participate in this peaceful demonstration, all of America will understand that even our babies know the difference between right and wrong, and that they want a good education. And I looked up because I was tired of the hand-me-down books. I was tired of being at a school that was supposedly without the resources. We had some good teachers, but they didn't have many resources. And uh, uh, it was very interesting that I asked what's its name, and his name, of course, was Dr. King, Dr. Martin King. I get home and I say, I've got to go. He wants us to march. And they say, absolutely not. I said, what do you mean not? They said, because it, it would mean you'd be going to jail. Absolutely not. And so in my independent way, I said to them, you know, you guys really are hypocrites. You make me go. I didn't want to go. You want me to listen to this man. I listen. He makes a suggestion, and now I can't do it. And of course, at that time, you did not tell your parents they were hypocrites. You did not do that. And if you can think back to the early 60s. And they, dad told me, go to your room. And I knew I was in trouble. But the next morning, they came in and after not sleeping. And they did let me go. Uh, and I understand now why, why people would not want their 12-year-old child marching and going to jail. And they said, it's not because we didn't trust you. We didn't trust, we, did, we don't trust, they said at the time, the people who would be over you in jail. But we'll put you in God's hands. And if you want to go, so it was really courageous of them. And teachers had been told that if, if a child of a teacher participated, the teacher would lose his or her job. So it was really courageous. That they did and that. you went to jail? I did go. I marched, and I ended up leading. There's a picture of me that people found uh, uh, in the line with the big kids and the little kids. And then the little kids, in about under 14, had to go to the special jail for children. And I was, I was, I had already skipped some grades, so I was more mature. I was about to go to the 10th grade, so I was more mature. I had older parents and, and educated parents. And most of the kids who went to jail were not from educated homes. They were from the projects. They had nothing to lose in that sense. They really, you know, the middle class, understandably, was very worried about their mortgages and everything else. So I was, I was very different in that way, and so I could speak up, and I did. I, was, I spent a week in jail. A terrible week, a horrible week in jail. But after that, um, I was stronger than ever. And what it taught me, what I say in this book that I just wrote is, it taught me that children can be empowered to do far more than we think when they're 12 years old, to think critically and to speak up for what they believe in and to understand what happens in the political process. And I'll never forget 
came back to school, and my principal, Alma Vivian Powell's uncle, was a mathematician, had to put us out of school. Boy, so I was suspended from school. And I was an A student, so it was awful. But he did something that was so powerful in terms of leadership. He could have just sent us out in, in disgrace, because at that time, you really didn't want to get sent home from school. And yet he did. He called the entire school, school this, this, the population uh, to the audience. And he made it into a ceremony, because uh, he didn't want to do it. He was really angry, but he had to do it. And this was leadership. He made it into a ceremony that paralleled the honor society ceremony, the induction into the honor society. <laughs> and I'll never forget his talking to me. I was close to him. He talked to me about civil disobedience and Thoreau. And it was powerful. It was just so powerful. But when he called each name up, it was almost as if each of us had a badge of courage. It was amazing. And when we all got up there, it's feeling so ambivalent, ugh, because you thought you'd done the right thing and you're being treated this way. Uh, he had had it in such a way that they gave us a standing ovation. And it was just, everybody cried. One of the things I think is interesting as you tell that story, you come back and you're mm. talking about the impact of the principal and yeah. how that was handled. People would naturally think you're going to talk about Dr. King at this moment, but no. it, sort of, it sort of reminds it's, us that the, that leaders. the leaders are everywhere. Yeah, that's, that's the point, because then, then teachers worked with children to get us the homework while we were out to make sure we didn't get behind. They really did. It was powerful. So there were, there were leaders at so many levels, and I, I guess that's the point I would make about leadership, that we make the mistake of focusing on the individual. And a lot of times when I've been in the paper, I've said, please, go deal with the, the campus, and the people like to focus it on one person. And the problem with that is, so when things don't go well, you, you blame the one person. People don't take ownership of the issues. They don't realize that leadership is about all of us, quite frankly. And if, if it works well, it should be everybody taking ownership. If it's not, we should be trying to figure out, OK, what else do we need to do to make it better? We don't do that enough. And that, that said, people do think of you as that inspiring leader. Yeah. But that must be, you say every day you got to get up and, and do it again. So what, what inspires you? Yeah, it's the same thing, the people. I mean, it's the concept of, um, of seeing kids who thought of themselves as OK and pretty good and whatever, and seeing them go to the level of being the very best, of seeing, of becoming the campus that is known now for producing kids who are going to get MD, PhDs, from all races, men and women, from Harvard to Stanford, of so having black kids, Hispanic kids, white kids now on the faculties of the best institutions in the country or working for companies, or of having three black males at the Yale Law School at one time, one per class, doing superbly, you see. You know, so it is the notion of excellence. It, that is what gives me goosebumps. Excellence among all students, and having people dreaming about, passionate about being the very best, and willing to work hard enough to be the very best. Even my young, I have a different projects. One is a young scholars program. My youngest freshman at UMBC ever was nine. And right now I have large numbers of kids there who, are, who will finish the calculus sequence before they're 13. Uh, many have come out of the Center for Talented Youth, but we and many have been homeschooled. Uh, and not for religious reasons so much, but because they needed more help. We don't give extraordinarily gifted children a lot of support in America, we, unless they're from great advantage. But we make them feel odd when they're very smart. We make them feel like something's wrong with them, you see. And we don't help them to develop emotional intelligence. That's why I wanted to do this. That's why I wanted to help children who really are far too bored to be in a typical gifted and talented course. You, so to be able to work with the very, very, the, the children who really, for whatever reasons, have been given these gifts, and to see what they do. And you know what they do that is so amazing? They probably work harder than anybody else. You see, we tend to think of genius as something where you just have and you lay back and you're fine. But no, I find that the most brilliant people work their butts off. They work really hard at whatever it is that they're doing. Now, they may sometimes have a, a thought in mathematics or something in music, whatever that is, at that moment, something that's inexplicable. But as a rule, I, what I say to my students when they come in and they, they're so excited, 
uh, my, my 17 year olds and you know, high school seniors can be typically very, very cocky themselves, thinking they're the smartest kid because they come from uh, high school, they've been in the top 10 of valedictorian. And I always say, you see that little kid right there? He finished Cal 3 when he was 13. Because I want everybody to know there's always somebody smarter. I don't care who you are. Get over it, I tell them. Get over it. It doesn't matter who's smart or by whatever standards. The question is, how do you define excellence and how do you work to be the best that you can be? Because you know, the books, the research shows people who are geniuses don't necessarily do better than anyone else in life, depending on how you define doing better. One of the reasons I started with that discussion of 22 plus yes, years yes. is that I, and we talked about this before, before we came, came out here, yes. is that I think a lot of times today, leaders leapfrog, they keep, they keep jumping. Right. And, and you talk about the importance of work. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's the hard, just when the work gets hard, yeah. somebody else offers something, leaders will skip here yeah. to there. Yes. And they can stay leaders and they can stay visible. Yeah. But you know, what drives you, how, how do you, I, I know I've kind of said that, but I mean, back to that issue of, of the opportunities that you may say, I'd like to put this on my bucket list or do that. Right. But seeing something through is, yeah. I think, one of the great legacies of your leadership. Not and that you're at a legacy point yet, but. I think with all of us in my, I, we, I like saying that everybody at UNBC is a part of the founding group, because it's all the first 50 years. The same year I went to jail in 1963, the state approved uh, the legislation for the founding of UMBC, 1963. The first students didn't come in until 1966. Uh, and yet, uh, in this 50 years, uh, we've become recognized by the best of institutions as among the best academically. From the undergrad experience and having the highest percentage go to grad school, 40%, to having as many as a dozen kids in one year interviewed at the Harvard Medical School, half minority, half white. And people said, what, what are you putting in the water down there? It was just, it was just wonderful. You know, so from, I mean, I, what I would say is that it is the fact that we have similar values. When you talk about leadership, mm -hmm. you have to talk about the culture of the institution or the organization or the company. And I mean, you talk about people, processes, culture. And I mean, it, it is that we have similar values. We believe in this idea of inclusive excellence we believed that we could figure out how to help students of all races succeed. We're the only campus, we were the campus started at a time, four-year campus, because I have great respect for Montgomery College, um, a four-year campus in the state of Maryland founded when, for the first time, students of all races could go there. Every other campus, four-year, was started either for blacks or whites, from College Park to UMES, you see, Morgan to whatever. Uh, but we were founded, so students from all, so if you think about it, we have been in a 50-year experiment. We will have our 50th anniversary in 1966. In 2016, first students came in in 1966. And so it's this idea, can you establish a university that can become a model for inclusive excellence? Students of all races. And, what, and one of the reasons that we are so diverse is Montgomery County. You're our number one feeder school system, by the way. We're very proud of that because you have the largest number of well-prepared paying customers. Thank you very much. <laughs> you, re you really do. You really do. And so we're here a lot. You and Howard County. We help the city. We help Baltimore County. But it helps sometimes to be a little distant, right? And, it, and so and we, get, we have students from 150 countries and a lot of kids from New York, New Jersey, and coming south, they would say. But Montgomery County is, helps us a lot with the international diversity. What's your favorite piece of advice to give to people when they ask you for some leadership advice? Hmm. Prepare, prepare. Uh, learn how to really prepare to know whatever it is you do well, to be really good at what you do while keeping a sense of humility. You know, my grandmother probably gave me the best advice and she, she, my parents were educated, but my this maternal grandmother who lived with us went to the sixth grade, and yet she's probably the wisest person I've ever known. And she said, I want you to remember to stay on your knees. She said, you're gonna do well because you, you are a hard worker and you are smart. She said, but you can read people. And this is when I was a child. You can read people. You can tell when people are authentic. She said, that will serve you well. She said, but stay on your knees for two reasons. One, 
But, but by the grace of God, you can make one mistake that could mess up your entire life, and you will make plenty of mistakes, he said, because everybody does. The question is whether you're caught. Aha. <laughs> uh, if you're not caught, just say, thanks, God. But number two, she said, um, as you go up the ladder, you will do well because you'll work hard and you can read people. She kept saying that. She said, people will knock you down. You will just get knocked down. You're going to get knocked down. Anybody get falls for whatever reason, she says. But if you're on your knees, you won't fall too far. It's powerful advice. And people get inflated, and they think they're all that and everything, and they get knocked down. They have nowhere to go. They're just so devastated. But if you're humble and you ask people for help, and you tell people, I made a mistake. I'm so sorry. I did my best. It didn't work out. People are supportive. I've made so many mistakes. But I've always just said, I'm sorry, folks. I did my best. We team did our best. It wasn't the right decision. We did the best we could under, what we, under the circumstances of what we knew. It was not. But, and people invariably will give you support if you're just honest. But if you lie, and that's the advice I was going to go to, if you lie and you try to hide it, people are not forgiving, understandably, because they can't trust you. They can trust you and they know you're doing your best and you're a good thinker, they'll work with you and help you. I'm gonna keep going with questions, yeah, but sure. I know that we're gonna, I, I just wanna say, I think there's some uh, cards going around of people who are going to have questions. We're gonna to get to audience questions. Um, I'm hoping that Allie or somebody will be over this way. Let me know when we have those uh, in a little bit. But you were just talking about mistakes that you've yeah. made. Oh, yeah. And I wanted to ask you about the, the issue of uh, failure. Yeah. And, and what is, especially being uh, into math and science and everything, you understand the right. importance of failure, but yeah. what is failure's role in, in, in the life of a successful leader? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same role it plays in life, whether you're a leader or not, in science or in any endeavor, if you're in, in entrepreneurship. We have 100 plus companies on campus, and we talk about this all the time, that for people to thrive, for leaders to succeed, for organizations to really continue to evolve and develop, there must be some room for failure. Because if you're, if you're only taking the safe steps, you can never go as far as you'd like to go or even imagine the possibilities of how far you might go. But if there is room for failure, if there is an understanding that you can learn more sometimes from failure than you can from success, then you can do much more. And that's the point about the, the reason the failure is so important. We sometimes, if we are wise, will step back when we fail, when we're knocked down, to figure out what happened. And you can learn things, whether in science or math or in life. You can learn things that can make you much stronger in the future. Everybody in here has experienced tragedy, which is not failure, but it's that bad experience. Uh, it's, it has, everyone has experienced a time when they've been disappointed. And if you think about it, about it, you will remember that it's in reflecting on the disappointment or the sadness of a death or whatever it is that you can gain and grow so much from which you can grow so much. It's from those experiences. Our subject is leadership, but one of your, one of your great loves. Yes. And I want you to talk about it yes. because I can't understand it. Right. Is math. <laughs> why? Why? why do you Always. Go, don't you all get goosebumps from math? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> a few people. Usually somebody will say, how can you put love and math in the same sentence? Maybe <laughs> that. And I do talk about it a lot because we Americans tend not to like math. And I was very fortunate. My mother, who had been an English teacher, went back when something came out called the new math. And... Uh, my dad was always good at math, so we were doing math problems in the house, but, but when she went back, what she learned was the reason so many people are not good at teaching math, two reasons. One, sometimes if you get it like that, then you really don't take the time to understand how other people might get it. And I mean, if I were to ask the audience this question, I, I can tell you the answer, but let me just ask this question. How many of you knew by the time you were in the 11th grade that you were either a math science type or a history, English, and arts type? Raise your hands. Look at the audience. And then you see, I mean, it's an American phenomenon. It's very interesting. And I didn't you, raise my if hand. You, ah, and it, for most people, if you ask them why, they will give you several reasons. One, well, I just like this other subject. Or just wasn't that good in this. 
But, you know, as I've said to big groups of math teachers, we math teachers have a way of looking at you. And if you're not excited about the work, <laughs> if you don't show that you're really into it like me as a math teacher, I'm going to give you a look that says, honey, I'll help you this year, but don't come back next year. <laughs> There's a look you get, you know, it's not for me. Mm -mm -mm. And, it, it, and we tend to assume that most people cannot do math. And, and I'm always telling mothers, don't tell your daughter you are good in math. Because as soon as the mother says it, and as soon as the girl has any problem, she says, well, I'm like my mom, right? You know? And so the key is I've always wanted, and my mother really did, with help from my dad, but my mother really did see this connection between language skills and math and science. We don't discuss problems in numbers. We discuss problems in words, whether it's in medicine or engineering, whatever the field. And what happens in quantitative areas is you translate from the words to symbols and then equations. But we've never taught people how to solve word problems. Most kids will say, give me the equation, 5x plus 10 equals 25, but don't give me the word problem because they've never looked at the connection. And that's, and that's what excites me. See, I'm usually mesmerized by everything he said, <laughs> but he lost me at quantitative right there. <laughs> totally, totally lost me there. We uh, have to <laughs> teach people not to turn off when they hear math. It's, it, it, because math is at the base of everything we do in our society. I mean, there are people who don't understand their taxes or mortgages or whatever because they don't know basic math. If, if, if I told you that I've had a 100% increase in the number of women faculty in physics, most Americans get really impressed. Wow, a 100% increase. But if I went from one to two, what the hell, is, what is that? <laughs> and, but we get impressed. Without, we don't know the basic questions to ask. Anytime someone tells you there's been an, a big increase in the percentage, you, got, you have to ask the question, what's the base? Because if you don't know the base, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, I'll never forget on Good Morning, uh, on one of the TV shows, I remember, <laughs> they, um, the man said, well, the private schools are much more sensitive to the American public than the public's uh, because they only had, um, they, I mean, they, and they talked about the percent of increase, right? Well, they had a small increase because the base, what it costs to go to private institutions is much more, much more, so you can have the same amount of money, but the percentage is much less. You get my point? As opposed to when you've got a smaller base, then it sounds like a bigger number. And, and yet the public said, oh my God, yeah, these, these institutions are more sensitive than that, without understanding fundamental mathematics. I know he's bored. Can I get, a, can I get an applause <laughs> for a man who gets into math? <laughs> so he does talk about math, but you've been talking about, uh, the, some people didn't even know the phrase STEM until right. not that many years ago, right, but right. you've been talking about it for oh, all yeah. along if you yeah. prepare students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I want you to, um, well, I'm going back to UMBC, mm -hmm. two, thi two things. Uh, the commitment to STEM, mm -hmm. and tell us about the Meyer, Meyerhoff Scholars. Okay, well, you know, and, and the point that I think Americans should consider is that when somebody is excited about STEM, it should not mean that there shouldn't also be excitement about areas beyond STEM. Uh, I read two, three books a week, novels, for fun. My wife and I read books together. Right now, je, ma femme Jacqueline et moi, nous étudions le français. Maintenant, parce que nous allons à Paris l'été prochain. We are in the middle, since high school, we haven't studied French. We're back to studying French. And I'm, I'm reading Victor Hugo. I'm learning French poetry. I mean, so uh, I enjoy classical piano. I mean, people don't have to be narrow only in STEM. In fact, we work to get my students who are going to be doctors or engineers to be broad to study the arts and humanities. The smartest people go across disciplines. So if I start with that context, I mean, because it is, it will be the humanities that will help us put the technology in perspective. The, the fact is that only about 5% of uh, Americans at age 25 have degrees in STEM. In Europe, it's 11%, more than twice what we have. And India is producing 800 additional universities right now, 800 additional universities. Now, and for anybody who says, well, why is STEM important? If you look at your economy, 50 to 80% of the GDP will be associated with STEM stock companies. Start, you know, the services that we have, will come, you, what's driving the economy? Whether it's about the, the military or, or intelligence, or it's about the environment and energy, or it's about health care, we all want to live longer and look better. It, and it, it, it has a science base, it really does. And, and you, of all people, would know it. I'm, I'm going to be tomorrow morning at the National Institutes of Health. You know, and this corridor is known for just that. So, I mean, STEM is extremely important. But I also will tell you that many of my students who are now chief information officers 
didn't actually have a major in STEM. They have a major in the humanities, but they took a few IT courses. And, and I tell my computer sciences majors this all the time because, quite frankly, why is it that those people who had an English major or a philosophy major moved up? Because they could talk to people. They weren't so techy techy that nobody understood them but the techies. You get my point? You know, and you'll find, I mean, they, when you look at scientists, you'll see they often are also excited about the arts or about reading novels or whatever. So it's important to make that point. STEM is important, as are the arts and humanities and social sciences. And so with that said, our campus is probably with the high, not probably, it is the campus that has the highest percentage of students in STEM majors in the state. Um, the only place that has a slightly higher uh, percentage would be the Naval Academy. What's the number, though? Well, the we're talking. I just wanted you to know I was uh, learning. Very good. I just wanted you to know. That's excellent. That's excellent. <laughs> we're at 54% uh, of our undergrad majors are in STEM areas, and about half of the degrees are in STEM areas. Uh, uh, everybody else is under 30%. I mean, College Park is about 24%. Everybody else is below 20%. Hopkins is about 30%. And one thing I wanted you to touch on, because I think it's such an example of the people that are yes. wanting to partner with yes. you is the Meyerhoff program. Yes. Can you tell us what that is? Sure, and it's gotten a lot of visibility. The Meyerhoff program started because Robert Meyerhoff, who's a philanthropist, um, asked a question, asked me a question in 1988. He said, why is it that everything we see on black males on TV is about sports or it's about handcuffs or violence? It was a very powerful statement. And this is as we were looking to figure out how we could help more minority kids succeed in science on our campus. Uh, and what people didn't understand was it wasn't just minorities who were not succeeding. That in America, most students who study science and engineering in the first year are wiped out or leave it within the first year or two. In fact, when I chaired the National Academies Committee, it did not surprise us that only 20% of blacks and Hispanics who began with a major in science or engineering graduated with such a major at the bachelor's level. It was a stunning statistic, though, to see that only a third, 32% of whites who begin with a major in science actually graduate in science. And for Asian Americans, who tend to do better than most groups in America, uh, it was only 41%. Now, let me give you one statistic that will put it all in perspective that, that sounds counterintuitive. Uh, the, the, the higher the SATs, the larger the number of AP credits in STEM, the more prestigious the university one attends the greater the probability the student who starts in science will leave it within the first year. So we're always proud to send people off to very, very prestigious, old, wealthy institutions. They start off as great physician, pre-med majors. They find us later on as great lawyers. That's supposed to be funny, folks. Come on, go ahead. <laughs> but it's actually true. Large numbers do go from pre-med to pre-law. Why? Because it takes brain power but there's a difference in the nature of the work between math, anything that's quantitative, versus the humanities or any of the social sciences. Any, one can read and write, and you don't have to work with other people, for example. If you can write fairly well, you can get at least a B. Okay? But here's the problem in math. I give you five problems on the calculus test. Three you've seen before. Two you've never seen before. If you've not worked with a group, or unless you just have an extraordinarily strong background, better than most, you end up not getting those two problems right. You get a D, even though you knew a lot of the work. You get discouraged and you leave it. And for all my friends in STEM in the, in the audience, the humanities and social sciences people come across as nicer to students than the STEM people. <laughs> you know they do. I mean, I'm focused on that math problem. You can come along with me if you want to. But if I'm an English teacher, I'm working with you. I'm trying to help you understand that your writing really is your sense of self. Right? And there is more of a nurturing in the humanities. There just is. In the arts, we know that is the case. Even though they may challenge, may critique, and whatever, they focus more. But we know, we know that people in STEM tend to be less gregarious, less, we know that. And as a result, people leave it. But they leave it primarily when they go to these top places with perfect scores because they didn't do well on the first test. They get C's in chemistry, but they got A's in everything else, and they say, oh my God, let me leave this immediately. In fact, many of my friends at the most prestigious of medical schools will tell you they did not major in science. They took just enough science to get into med school and to keep their grades up. Did you get that? 
So what makes us different is that we not, not only get them into med school, we actually have large numbers who go for MD, PhDs, which is far more difficult. I mean, it's not hard for our students to go to med school, but MD, PhDs, you've got to be in the top 5% of the medical school class. Think about it. So you've really got to be good in biochemistry or in biophysics or one of these areas, and we figured out how to do that. And Meyerhoff started us with that, with black males, black kids. We figured out if we could help those who are at the bottom, and we know that, the underrepresented groups tend to be at the bottom academically. If we could figure out how to help them, we might learn some things to help all students. And the best news is, we got so good at helping those, my white students said, we want what they're getting. <laughs> now, how often do white folks say they want what the minorities are getting? Come on, come on now, you all know what I'm saying. So it must have been really good. And it was, it was about building community. It was getting away from the cutthroat approach, because in science, too often, kids are even scared to leave their lab stuff, because somebody may tamper with it. Because if you grade on the curve, it discourages people from working together because you can't trust people. And that is the, that is the mindset. So what we learned from the Meyerhoff has helped us not only with students of all races, but across disciplines beyond science. So we have redesigned the first year and now second year work to get away from the lecture mode and to do much more group work, collaboration. In chemistry, for example, if you look at the UMBC website, you'll see the Chemistry Discovery Center for the first year work. And it's not about chemistry lecturing. It's about people working in groups, uh, using an entrepreneurship model. You've got a project manager, a blogger, or a technologist, and all these. And they work, and we don't give them the theories. They have to struggle, fight for, work with each other in order to come up with the theories. So it's not people sitting back passively, letting knowledge into their heads. Rather, it's about they're learning how to think critically and with active learning. And it makes all the difference in the world. So some of you have been listening. I, I, I would just like a, 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 give me an applause meter. If you think that some of the great successful folks are going to come out of a school called UMBC and leaders out of, if you're starting to get a sense of this, <laughs> give me a round of applause if you think so. <laughs> That's nice. And I think we're gonna, I'm going to get the audience questions sent up here. I'm going to get those uh, brought up to here. But before, before we get to, I know you have good questions, and, we're gonna, and I'm going to get a chance to, to fire through those. Howie's going to bring me all of your questions. Mm -hmm. But uh, I hope some people out here have seen Inside the Actor Studio before, because uh, I'm going to channel my, my uh, Dean Emeritus James Lipton here for a yeah. moment, if you've ever seen uh, Inside the Actor Studio. By the way, uh, These, we, Beckett is our muse. I have to tell you this. I didn't say this, but we are really good at theater. We have a new Arts of Humanities facility. I want you to come see it, and we're proud of what you have here. But, but, but literally, we do the kind of theater that either depresses you or pisses you off. <laughs> I mean, students are, and so we've been to the American College Theater Festival. We've won that and been to the Kennedy Center seven times in the past 25 years. I mean, we do that. Give us a hand for that. That's a big deal. We do really serious theater that combines literature, philosophy, and, and the and I'm very proud you did of a that. nice job of bringing back the arts and humanities yeah. folks there. At the yeah. end. All right, here we go. Anybody that knows how this goes, these, yes. an these answers have to be crisp. Okay. One word, two okay. words, maybe three. Okay. Four, three or four words at the most. All right. What is your favorite word? Passion. I was going to go with math. What is your least favorite word? No. What turns you on? You don't want to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> Cut the tape. <laughs> I'm not on college campus. You don't ask somebody on college campus that question. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> what turns you off? <laughs> uh, cowardice. All right. Yeah. What sound or noise do you love? The, oh, uh, the water at the beach, yeah. What that sound noise. or noise do you hate? It's scratching on the board. <laughs> the math board. Yeah. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? <laughs> uh, to be a K-12 teacher. <laughs> you would say it's the same thing, education. But it's always education for me. I mean, I just, it's, uh, education is so amazing. So what? if I wasn't doing college education stuff, I'd be working, I'd love to work. I, I really enjoy like third and fourth grade kids. You know, you really, I was with, in a school recently, and I'm on the floor doing this math. Three word this. answers. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> K through 12, K through 12. I'd be working with elementary kids. What and profession kids. would you not like to do? Professional sports. Ooh. And if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Let's party. Because <laughs> uh, I don't want to be boring walking around being reverent. I mean, that is boring to me. Wait a minute. Let's have fun. We need some fun in the world. Wait a minute. 
<laughs> All right, let's party through some questions here. Uh, thank you, everybody, that submitted these. I guess if we get through these, you keep sending them up. We'll try to get okay. through as many as you, we can. Uh, this first question is, what's the Latino population percentage at UMBC? Yes. And what are you doing to increase the it's numbers great. there? We've gone, for, remember, Baltimore is not like Mo Montgomery County. We are more southern than you are. And yet we have to, we've gone from about 2% to almost 6%. Between five and six percent, and at the grad level, interestingly enough, we have a substantial number. In fact, the most recent issue of the American Association of College Universities, called Peer Review, has a number of articles by uh, a number of Latina, uh, several of whom are faculty members at UMBC, and our PhD graduates who are now back at University of Puerto Rico. Uh, and you'd find there's an article that I refer you to called the Jessica Effect, which has to do with uh, ten years ago, a Puerto Rican student from the University of Puerto Rico was in chemical engineering, and uh, her husband just couldn't believe that she was working late at night in the lab, and he came one night and in the parking lot killed her. Awful, just awful. And faculty and students thought about this long enough that we came up with an approach called the Jessica Effect. That is for Latino families, but also minority families, and anybody else who may not be accustomed to grad school, of bringing families into the work of having of times when we celebrate so they can see what students are doing, so husbands can see, quite frankly, how their, their, their wives are working in the labs. I mean, if you've not been in college and you've got somebody who's in a PhD program, you really don't get it. You don't know what they have to go through. And uh, it's powerful, and that has led to just an attraction of people, including a number of Hispanic students. So we get students from, uh, I mean, as you might expect from the Autonomous University of Mexico, University of Puerto Rico, but we're now getting more kids, Mexican-American kids out of Texas, for example, kids from Montgomery County, especially. Uh, there, and we have uh, the uh, East Baltimore Latino organization. We've got an alumni group, and we've got more Hispanic faculty than ever, and it's coming. It is. I know you're going to like this one. Can you discuss the problem of college affordability? Right. Uh, several things. I think. Community colleges are one of the best factors in public higher education in America ever. Because one can get a fine education at a two-year institution, transfer, and, and do quite well. And most people who are over 45 or so don't really appreciate the fact half of students in higher education are in two-year institutions. And you've got some wonderful faculty members at places like Montgomery College. And so that, that helps with that factor. For us, uh, the key is revenue building. So we really work to have students involved in internships that are related to their majors. If they're in the humanities, we may have them working and doing things involving anything from um, uh, marketing, human resources, that kind, then people in technology are doing things, so they can pay for that education as we work to keep costs down. And I do think that Americans tend to confuse social prestige and academic quality. People tend to think it has to be private and expensive to be good so often. And that just is not the case. I've got too many uh, family friends who've gone to the best named places who weren't serious and who really didn't get anything like the education they just wanted to have. So it, it, what, we, what we have not made clear is that people need to understand the differences in costs across institutions. There are all kinds of fine institutions. But what is it you're paying for? They need to understand that. Number two, that the quality of education at any institution is directly uh, related to what the person puts into it. If the person is just there for his or her parents, it's a mediocre education anyway. Because what we want to do is to teach people to think critically, to be passionate about learning. One can be at all kinds of places and get that. Doesn't have to require $65,000 a year to get a superb education. That's the point that Americans don't get that we need to really focus on much more. And that's not, I mean, I think they're wonderful public and private institutions, but people need to look at the relationship between what they have to spend, how much loan they'd be in, and those kinds of factors. The next audience question is a good one. Uh, diversity, what can other US institutions of higher education learn from UMBC? To look in the mirror and to know it's not just about what the students do, it's about what the entire institution decides to do. The reason we're doing so well with students of different races is that faculty and staff said, let's look at ourselves, let's look at how we support students, how we might support students, how we can connect to them to give them more support. Let's see how the institution might want to change in order to be as accommodating and supportive of people while keeping the standards high. All right. 
Next question uh, submitted says, you talked about the importance of your parents. Yeah. How can we motivate parents to get involved in the education of their children, specifically minority parents? Right. And one of the reasons I wrote two books on raising smart black kids, we were, looked at the Maha program and what parents had done, only half of whom were from educated families. I, I, do, I just gave a talk to all the minority parents, black and some Hispanic, but heavily black in Howard County. And I've talked about some of these issues and said some things that some people liked, some people did not like. Whether you know it or not, um, the children doing the best in our country often have at least one parent from another country. If you look at what happens in America, if you look at the most successful kids in science and engineering, the vast majority have at least one parent from another country. Why? It has to do with what happens in the home. It has to do with that hunger. If you look at the Nobel laureates in America, so many came out of homes where um, parents didn't even necessarily speak English in New York. And the people went to the poor man's Harvard, uh, City College, or Brooklyn College, right? Mm -hmm. Got a superb education, and went on and got the Nobel Prize from the humanities and the sciences. Why? It was the hunger. It was the passion for education, for learning, that made the difference. It's what we, from some of us from the Deep South say, we sometimes say we come from another country when we come from Alabama, right? But you learn to be <laughs> twice as good. You learn to work your butt off. And that's what makes the difference. And that's what parents need to understand that, that, I mean, it's not about blaming a teacher. It is about how you support that teacher in helping your child to think well. And when you talk about common core standards, yes, it's a bit more difficult, but it's what the rest of the world is doing right now. It's that they are teaching their children how to think critically and spending more time and effort in learning how to read critically, how to compute and analyze. And we have to do much more of that. And we need parents to understand no excuses. No excuses. And for kids who come from homes where there are issues with parents, we need ways of giving those children more support when, the child, when it's not the child's fault. But I'm saying for working in middle class families, I'm saying Americans of all races can do more to help their children than they do, than most. Now, some do, but many can do much more, much more. So I like this question a lot that came from the audience because I had thrown out that date to let people see yes. what it's like to see through yeah. uh, a vision and yes. to stick with a, a leadership sure. post. And this question says, did you see UMBC in 1992 being what it is today? And if so, what did you see on that campus that inspired the vision? It was the fact that we'd come that far, literally, in about 25 years. And I said, if we can do this in the first quarter of a century, what can we do in the second half? The second half of this century, of this, just this next 25 years. And I think they're saying way back to the beginning. Yeah. Could you see this? I could happening? not have imagined we'd come this far. Even though we went, we, people got out my, my uh, speech, the speech you get for installation, and I said one day we'd be, we'd be uh, uh, included in the same sentence with Stanford, because Stanford was not Stanford 50 years ago, even, you see, and uh, how far they've come, mm -hmm. and to be at the very top. And if you look at the list of what presidents and provosts use to say which are the best campuses in the country, it's a big deal that we're in the top 10. We are actually, in terms of what, from the presidents of Harvard to the Ivies, when they said we're the most interesting academic place, best quality undergrad education, we're actually ahead of Brown and Stanford. Give us a big hand for that. Big hand. Big, I mean, people can't even. Yeah. Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. And I can prove it because I look at how well my students do when they go to the best place. We had five students at Cambridge at the same time from getting PhDs from gravitational physics to medieval literature. It just doesn't get any better than that. That's what I mean. That it just, mm -hmm. when, when Drew had me stand at Harvard for getting an honorary degree, not because of me, but because of what UMBC is doing, she said when it comes in front of 500 of her closest friends, she said, she's a wonderful president, she said, it's President Harvard, she said when it comes to the UMBC product of all races, from the humanities to the sciences, two words we use, consistently superb. Now when you've got the president of Harvard saying that, at commencement. It just doesn't get any better than that. Do you, mm -hmm. Give me a hand for that. That's what I did. It just doesn't. It's just and, that a middle class place in Maryland can do that well. And it's you're you're going to brush me along when I say this, but we are looking at a man who could be the president of Harvard, the president of the But what could be better than the other university? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the point. That's the point.
that, you know, that we've been able to do so well with taxpayers' money and middle class people struggling. What could be more American, more fascinating than doing it there? You see, All that's, right. Yeah. So this is a good question from the audience, a wonderful question. What skills and abilities do you recommend that young people entering the world of work continue to develop? Mm. The, the ability, first of all, to just to think and, and, and reading skills. I mean, people always think, I'm going to say something about math. No, reading and thinking skills. Reading, writing, speaking, and thinking skills. People judge us by how we speak, how we write, how we think. Good writing is good thinking. Clear, standard English. Being able to speak and to express oneself clearly. Very important. Communication skills are critical. And then emotional intelligence. What am I saying? The ability to work with all kinds of people. You know, the, the Jobs book is a fascinating read. Fascinating read. He said himself, he, he lacked it. He was not a nice man. He gave us the iPhone, but he said it when they asked him, why were you so mean to people? His response was, well, everybody knows I'm an asshole. That's what he said, right? <laughs> well, we don't want people to be that way. That's not a civilized society. We want people who have brain power, but who have compassion, who know how to interact with people, who know how to read cues, who know how to, how to, quite frankly, work in the sandbox and work as a team member. A leader is somebody who can work with people. You know, this is. I'm so glad I'm getting these great, great audience questions, making me look so good up here. I'm going to give you another one here. How did you go about getting stakeholders? And this is noticed people such as alumni, oh. government, private sector, business folks to begin to invest in the early evolution of UMBC, and how have you gone about sustaining and enhancing those investments in a weakened, not my words, in a weakened educational environment? Great question. Uh, in the first years, it was those of us working as a team thought through who we wanted to be, how we wanted to be different from other campuses, not trying to emulate so much anybody. If there were one campus that I found fascinating more than any other. It was actually the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Um, they actually had taken two of our top scientists, given them major increases in salary while they still had houses here in Maryland. And, um, I, and one became the provost and I spent time there. And they were, they were founded in the early 90s. Remember when they had $2 billion to start a university? And the question was, if you don't start with a lot of of people who've just been around and you can do anything you want to do and you got $2 billion to create a university, what do you do? And what they did was uh, really reaffirming, they, you go for the smartest people. That's in anybody's business. You want the smartest, hardworking people who can really work hard, get it done, work with other people, set the goal, have the same values. And so when I would go there, I would see just that. And I saw many practices that we found very helpful. So we were doing more with technology in the library 20 years ago, understanding you can never keep up with all the volumes. You got the idea is how do you get to uh, being able to get to the, the knowledge you know, in real time with technology. So they had, they had hired the librarian from Caltech to be their librarian. They had all these people from the National Academies in Canada, England, and in America. And what was really significant was how they talked about building community. And so rather than every faculty member having a piece of equipment, even then they were focused on interdisciplinarity and big pieces of equipment for centers where people could come and solve problems together and build synergy. And it was fascinating. And we, 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 came, we did the same kind of thing. And then most important to say in an unabashed way that merit counts, that it's not about everybody getting the same thing, that the most productive colleagues in research and the best teachers should actually be the ones who get the greatest rewards, to work to attract the very best and then let the community know, here are our best. And if you want to be a real part of this place, you work to be like these people. And that's what any place does. It's as if you know the segues into some of these questions here sometimes. Um, the next question, how do you balance and celebrate diversity with unity of purpose for our nation? Well, I, I, I think the failure of right now of our institutions in education is that we have not emphasized 
the need to hear other perspectives. When we're in an argument or a discussion, we're so accustomed to things moving like this from, from the media that we rarely take the time to reflect on different positions to see where there might be points of commonality or intersection. And we've all been taught to think that while the other person is talking, I've got to be figuring out what I can say to tell them they're wrong, as opposed to trying to hear what somebody's saying to see where's the common ground. You know, I said this to a group of educators when we were talking about Washington and how we are bothered by people not working together. I said, well, you know, we need to study our history because this is not the first time this has happened. I mean, come on, I mean, we're acting like everything is wonderful. You go back to the 60s. I mean, Lyndon Johnson made such a difference. President Kennedy was not able to get people to work together. You go back and look at the history of Congress not passing much. You know, so we, it's not like this is the first time. You can go back to another century and see these issues. But the point I'm making is that it seems to be an enlightened society is one that teaches its young to hear and appreciate other perspectives and to see ways of connecting. We do too little of that. And so I'll give an example. I say on our campus to freshmen and to new students and others, get beyond your comfort zone. I don't want you just with people just like yourselves. I want you to get to know people from different parts of the world, people with different cultures. You don't want to leave here saying you saw those people over there. And too often in environments, we make the mistake of thinking that because you've got 50 cultures represented, people are connecting. Often they're still in just in their groups. And what we are working to do at UMBC is to get people to look into, into the faces of people who are different and to understand connectedness of human beings. You get my point? It's, it, and it's, it is not easily done because our society doesn't do it. We tend to think stereotypically about different groups in different ways. You get a room full of leaders, you get great leadership questions. Here's one. What, was, what has been your greatest leadership challenge, and what did you learn from it? The personal challenge is learning to have balance in my own life. I'm really blessed to have a wife who is smarter than I am. She actually got the higher grade on the first math test, and I fell in love immediately. <laughs> the, uh, and, uh, What's interesting is we've been married. I've been married since I was 19. Uh, I've been married. We will celebrate yeah. our, yeah, it's really good, it's a good thing. I'll be celebrating, as I said, we're going to Zalon Apali. I put a note to the Anna Perset, the mariage, uh, uh, Caron Saint, 45 years. We're celebrating 45 years. It's a real blessing, really is, because she's still a beautiful woman, all right? The, uh, and what's amazing is that uh, balance, she has just been, a, we both are such mega nerds. She's understood how hard I've worked. She's worked hard. She was at Tiwa Price for years. And what I'm saying is that leaders have to think about this. This is what I, I work with new college presidents at, at Harvard every year. There's a program for new presidents. And so for the last 15 years or so, uh, I give seminars there. And, and I always surprise them because I give this major seminar on the academic role of the president. But I always shock them when they say, what's the most important thing to know? And I always surprise them. I said, take care of yourself, your health. It always surprises them. They expect me to talk about intellectual matters, and I'm saying, you, if you don't have your health, you're really challenged. And as leaders, often, presidents and others are really challenged because few people know what they go through if they've not been in that position. And, and so you'll see a lot of college presidents who have had major health issues, uh, from suicides to heart attacks to all of that. And so, the notion, and so for me, having the balance, because I do work 14, 15 hours a day, six to six and a half days a week. So how does one create balance with that has been the ongoing challenge. And it's not so much important that you ever achieve the balance, it's that you never forget that you need to have the balance. You get that? And There's the difference. And it, if one of our cameras could zoom in, I think that's a fit, Fitbit on his uh, on That's exactly, oh yeah. There. He is, I got my, I've got, I, right. it, it is actually the up band, up <laughs> jawbone band. And uh, so I do with my students, I do insanity. I just lost 20 pounds. I'm feeling really good about that. Give me a hand right. for that yeah. now. I'm really, yeah. really good. Because we Americans have a problem. We know that with the weight thing. And when you're president, everybody's trying to feed you and give you something to drink all the time. You know, I'm going like that. But, uh, but health. I'm saying that my greatest challenge has been to maintain 
uh, those practices from exercise to the right eating to meditation that will give me emotional and physical and mental health. It may sound simplistic, but it is the challenge of life of leaders to stay fit. Well, I'm going to do my best. I still got okay. a stack here. You can right. see you can okay. see these uh, great audience questions still coming up, and uh, I'm going to try to get through them. And I assume I'm going to get the hook when when I get the hook. But I'm going to keep firing through as many of these sure. as we can here. All right, I'll give you a quick answer. First one: uh, What do you think we can do to improve primary and secondary education in the U.S. in a way that links up with better, more holistic education in higher education? I I think we we first have to understand the importance of pre-K, really. Um, natal through pre-K. I mean, there, there's a foundation that needs to be there for every child, and we don't really appreciate how strong that influence is, those first years. And then we have to get away from blaming different groups. Colleges blame high schools who blame middle school, who blame elementary, who blame the parents, and the daddy blames, blames the mother. You know, it's, we just blame all the way down the line. Yeah. <laughs> Got to get away from that and have many more strong connections across different levels of education to look at what works and what does not work and more reinforcement. Biggest problem right now in America beyond the STEM problem is that people don't graduate. They start college and don't graduate. And the number one reason for that is that they, they haven't gotten beyond remedial math and reading. And you may not know it, but developmental math and reading, same as remedial, which is one of those words, is at the level of middle school. We're talking about middle school math and reading. And I'm telling you, 40 to 50 percent of Americans of all races start college with that work. And the probability if you start with remedial math or development math of getting beyond it to graduate with a four-year degree is, is literally under 0.2. And for low-income children, it's under 0.1. So I mean, fundamental issues. I just want you to know how amazing this is. He segues himself. He has no idea what these questions are. And after that answer, listen to this question. This is the next question we have. Should the math requirement to obtain a college degree in Maryland be based on a student's major? Huh? Right into that. Huh? I think it should, be, it should be based on the major. It should be appropriate and applicable in one way or the other. We, we are much too rigid sometimes. We are in terms of what's required, because what a lot of educated people will tell me is they don't remember a thing they did in math. <laughs> um, there is a kind of math we can teach, and I think the Common Core will get to some of that. I think that, that uh, statistics is something we are saying people use in different ways. But we need, it's not just the kind of math, it's how we teach. So here's the, the fundamental question. If I go to the board and I give you a lecture on differential equations, and you say, wow, that's really eloquently presented, and Wow, this teacher is really great. And then I give everybody a test, and most people fail it. The question is, did I teach it? See, I would argue, no. I presented it. I only taught it effectively if you get it. So we have this mindset, if the class doesn't do well, then somehow it's, their, it, somehow it's what they didn't do. I don't care how clear I thought I was. If I'm not getting through, we have to find ways of helping people, students, to grasp it. Often the reason they don't grasp it, they don't have the background, or, and one thing builds on another, or they're not listening, they're not involved. How do we get them engaged? That's, those are the questions that we have to ask. So for me, it's, yeah, we need to make sure the math is applicable. Everybody doesn't have to have calculus, for example. Uh, we can make it applicable, but it's more how we teach it, how we get students engaged, how we get away from the fear in mathematics, how we show applications. I'll, the most impressive math class I've ever seen involved green construction in LA, where students who were getting a GED were learning geometry while building a house. They saw area and perimeter and Pythagorean theorem, and I mean, in, they didn't even think they were doing math. And by the time they finished and they had a test to take, it was a piece of cake. They were just building a house. It was applied. We don't have enough of the work connected to something. And the typical kid in geometry says, when am I going to use this? And the typical answer from those of us who are geometry teachers is, well, this is teaching you how to think, right? And the kid is thinking, I know how to think. I think you suck. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> I see their faces when they say it, right? We've got to find ways. We need many more opportunities for teachers to work in companies and for people who worked in companies to come into schools and give applications. You know, I, the best grants we've gotten have involved getting former engineers, former business people in working with kids for two reasons. One, they have reared children, 
so they won't take any stuff. They're good in helping with all kinds of kids. And number two, they have applications for real life. We need to bring the education across disciplines to real life. Long answer. You, you do it every time. Now, now this next question here, uh, uh, somebody, I'm going to try to do my best. I don't know if it's a he or she, so I'll say he or she yeah. wrote this question out. Recently met with folks at Microsoft yeah. and said that 64% of the jobs that our kids will have in 20 years have not even been created yet. Right. How do you educate youth for jobs that are just imagery, yeah. imaginary at this point well, today? Well, it, it's by not simply giving them technology or math and science. It is this ability to be adaptable. I didn't say that earlier, and I should have, for leaders and for anybody going into the workplace. We have to be able to adapt. A, a broad education, this is why the liberal arts broadly, math and science are part of the liberal arts, by the way, but clearly the humanities and the arts can teach us to be capable of adapting to change by reading literature and studying philosophy and understanding history. We put our own experiences in perspective, but we learn to be broader than if we're just techie techie or learning facts for today. What we need to be doing in the education, whether in a class on T.S. Eliot and the Wasteland or in a class involving uh, great philosophers, uh, or in a calculus class, we should be teaching people how to think broadly, how to solve problems they've not seen before, how to adjust to the notion that most of the most interesting and most challenging problems are the kind that cannot be solved like that. It's the patience to persevere. Well, it's, if you're a lawyer in the place and you're working on an issue on a case, or you're a physician, you know, if you think about it, it takes time, perseverance, there's the habits of mind that lead people not to get frustrated and give up. It's the perseverance that, it seems to me, is most critical. I'm told we have about four or five more minutes, yes. so I'm going to try to get through a couple more of okay, these. Yeah. This next one, I had certainly not heard this, so this is not me saying this, but uh, an audience member heard <laughs> that there, there, there may have been a plan to change the name of UMBC. <laughs> Is this true and why? And before you answer the question, I just want to say one thing I do know, yes. spending my career in public relations right. and marketing, is right. I've heard very, very often it said that yes. you, it's very deliberate to say UMBC yes. in an atmosphere where when people think of the University of Maryland, they right. go flagship to sure. College Park or what sure. have you. And we have uh, the, the founding university in, in Baltimore City and yes. the medical schools right. and everything. So UMBC. Uh, is, is a specific brand, but yeah. I'll let you speak to whether this is a rumor, but also why UMBC as the brand. Well, you know, you think UCLA, USC, we're, ah. in, a, we're in an environment. Uh, the longer it's around, the more people appreciate it. UVA, even, if you think about it. You know, when, the longer you're around, the more people get it. Uh, my, my donors who are from very prestigious places really want me to change the name. And, and I get that, and what we say is this, when I get, I used to say when I got that 100 million, now I say when I get that half billion, we'll change the name for that person, all right? Because 100 million just isn't what it used to be. You know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding you, I promise you, wait a minute. But, uh, <laughs> but, but it will take a lot of money to change it now because we are a winner. I, and, and number, and, and you, if you're in business people, um, what's the number one goal? You've gotta have a product, if you think about it, you've got to know that the brand is worth something and that people want that brand. Well, our biggest challenge, unlike almost any other place around, we, we, we literally don't have the, the space or the room right now for all the students who want to come to UMBC. Wow. I mean, we are, we're just bursting it. We're at, and we, I mean, we could be 20 some thousand tomorrow. We don't want that. We, we want to stay a mid size and grow very carefully. So we had about 14,000 students, of whom 3,000 are grad students. And, and we've got about 7,000 more students we train in our companies, but in terms of regular college students, everything, it's about 14. So, and, we'd like, and, and with the, the top quarter of our freshman class, for those of you who remember the, the math verbal piece of the SAT, top quarter for, just for math and verbal, it's 1450. And here's the difference from a wonderful private place that may have that, the, half, the whole half at that end. The half, the top half, I mean, the average is in the 12s, but the top quarter, 1450, what's significant about that group is that they did not often take SAT prep. You see, my son and most middle class people have some SAT prep. I wrote the questions for the SAT. I know how much prep takes it up. I'm telling you, these kids come in with perfect math scores all the time. 
Centennial High School in Howard County sends us almost 60 kids a year. And you'd be surprised how many of them have either, either perfect or near perfect, and how many have 40 some AP credits. Easily got fives on AP, A, B, and B, C calculus and all of those things. So, so when you've got that going, you don't worry about the name so much. It just denotes it's, it means high quality. It is, we say, an honest place because it's a nerdy place. We like that. It is a place where math rocks, but where people also love Beckett. That's not a bad story, right? Yeah. Well, the audience, you all had some great questions. Hope we have some nerds in the audience who kind of, kind of enjoyed uh, tonight. I think what you had here uh, was sort of a graduate level course in leadership tonight. <laughs> so uh, we're happy that you could be with us, Dr. Hrabowski. This was a real honor for us to have you as part of the Leadership Montgomery Program. And uh, I know I enjoyed very, very much the chance to uh, just uh, set up these questions for you and to hear you talk. Let me just so. one comment to Montgomery County, to, to you. I mean, this yours is an amazing community. Uh, people think you're rich, but you have people of all income brackets, people from all over the world. Uh, you are well-educated and yet enlightened enough to know everybody doesn't have that education. You are more giving and understanding of the need to give. And I've said this to Esther before, uh, this program in producing these leaders in such an amazing community. The question, it seems to me, the ineluctable question is, what do you do when you are one of the, when you are one of the best educated, one of the wealthiest counties, in one of the wealthiest states, in the wealthiest country in the world? And I would say to any group, if you really want to know what to do, Go ahead and look and see what Montgomery County is doing, because you're doing it the right way. I commend you, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you all. Dr. Freeman Rabowski. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.